Olive oil is a cause of breast cancer. The data is really solid today. Increasing animal protein in the diet accelerates aging and shortens human lifespan. And the same study shows increasing plant protein extends human lifespan. You can't supplement and drug yourself into living longer. The whole point of wanting to age slower is so we can enjoy our life more as we age. We should keep our body fat favorable as we age, and that's how we slow the aging process. The best way to maintain your stem cells Last time we, we spoke, you know, you, you mentioned that you, you did have an injury um, and then, you know, you want to take us through that journey, uh, you know, brought you all the way up to today, you know? I was, I was third in the world in pairs figure skating. I was a really serious athlete training hours and hours every day. And I hurt my heel and my right foot so I couldn't walk for almost a year. Um, so I was hospitalized because the Olympic Committee, I was ranked number one in the country in pair skating at the time because the number, we came in second in the 1973 Nationals and the team ahead of us that beat us um, had retired. So we were number one ranked in the country at that point. And then I couldn't compete and get my, I couldn't win the national championships. I couldn't even walk hardly. I hurt my, my foot so badly. What did you do? How'd you hurt it? I hurt it landing incorrectly on triple jumps, trying for a heart for a triple jump. And my boot kind of like fell apart. And the, there was like a screw in the boot that split the fat pad um, oh. under my heel. So I lost the, the natural protective gristle and fat you have under the heel bone, the calcaneus, you know. Um, so, Doc, you know of Joe Namath, the football player? Of course, yeah, yeah. So I was hospitalized under the care of the, jo of the Jets physician, um, Dr. Nicholas, in, at um, Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. And so he'd um, come into my room and like push on my heel. And I'd say, you're killing me. It's like, it's so tender there. Why are you doing that? You know, he, he, I was a guinea pig to him. So one day um, I'm in the hospital. I'm still lifting weights in bed and doing crunches and everything. and trying to stay mm -hmm. in shape, but I, can't, but I couldn't put weight on that foot. Um, so one day the nurse comes in and brings me a, a, a antibiotics to take. And I say, why are you giving me antibiotics? And she says, because you're having surgery tomorrow on your foot. And I'm some surgery on my foot. Nobody's discussed that with me. You know, I'm, I'm like 19 or 20 years old. Imagine they, imagine the doctor signs you up for surgery doesn't even have discussion to tell you what he's going to do. Crazy. You know? and absolutely yeah. insane. So I said, well, I'm not going to have any kind of surgery, but, but have the doctor come in and talk to me about it. So he comes in and he says, we have to lacerate the area, take it apart, cut it up in like a checkerboard to inflame it so that it heals better because you're not going to get repair and healing of this tissue if we do nothing. So I'm, so I said to him, um, okay, well, how many people have you done this with and show me some, you know, where the data of this has been performed before? And he said, well, we question. don't have any, what's that? Yeah. Question. Is this before or after you started your medical program? Oh, this was way before I was only like 20 years old. I didn't go to medical school till I was 30, till I was 30 years old. Oh, okay. So 10 years before I went to medical school. You know, and even was this then, experience the reason why you became a doctor? No. <laughs> 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 so when I asked him what, you know, what, um, you know, what, ex what kind of experiences he had doing this, what are the patients who've done it with? He said, none. He, they're working on it with like lab animals or something, you know? So I said, no way. I'm getting out of here then. There's no way he could help me. He was just torturing me in the hospital. I was thinking, you know, so, so then I went to Texas and I, then I did a fast to see if fasting could stimulate healing, which didn't really work either. It was just, I don't even know if the fasting helped to heal. It just eventually, it got somewhat better. It didn't get totally normal. It just got better, you know. Throughout my whole skating career in early teenage and late and early 20s, I was interested in nutritional excellence, reading all the books on the subject. I read all of Dr. Shelton's works and all, you know, I was very much enmeshed in that world and eating super healthfully. As like a natural, quote, natural hygienist at that point, which I felt was useful for having better conditioning and stamina. It's like Novik Djokovic. Why was he such a bad tennis, not bad, but why was he not a top tennis player when he was 21 and 22 and 23? Because he didn't have the fitness to last five sets at a top major. He would poop out. And then he changed, improved his diet and he became more fit and, his, and he became where he can have more stamina. So I ate to improve my stamina and conditioning. So we were competing with the Russians and they could just move on those programs for five minutes straight and keep flying at the end and never tire out. And we wanted to improve our stamina. So I was reading books and I was trying to improve my conditioning and stamina. It's all about you know being able to oxygenate and breathe and not get sick. So I've advised a lot of top professional and Olympic athletes. I've advised a lot of Olympic skiers, for example. I talk about one person I advised is Eric Schloppy. 
He was on four Olympic Games in downhill skiing. He competed till he's 36 years old. Like Djokovic competes in tennis at age 36, he's just as, it's kind of special that he competed in the downhill racing through the Olympics for four Olympic Games till he was 36. You know what I mean? Anyway, so we do it to maintain our youthful vigor and vitality longer and to have better conditioning. And the professional skiers would do it. And professional tennis players, I advise doing this because they didn't want to get sick and get ill as frequently because one being in bed with a virus for four days could kill you, could kill your career for the year too, you know? Um, so all these things. So I got into this when I was relatively young as an athlete and because my father was overweight and sickly and he introduced me to his transformation when he um, learned about read old Dr. Shelton's works. So I was already, um, so when I was working in my father's shoe business after I was weaning down on my skating career, I was thinking that my real passion lied in nutrition and being a physician specializing in nutrition. So I was contemplating and starting to take some courses to think about going back to medical school. But I hadn't had the right pre-medical requirements because when I was in college as a figure skater, I was taking all business and economics courses and other things and not, I wasn't um, preparing myself with the idea of going to medical school. Yeah, it's a very so, different career path for sure. A real different career path. So I had to go back to the postgraduate pre-med program at Columbia and get, um, and get all my pre-medical requirements. You know, and I, I actually had like, given up on that idea. It seemed, you know, I hadn't had the right courses. I kind of thought it's just too hard. I can't do it. And I started dating this woman who became my wife, Lisa. And she was a, and she was a pre-med student applying to medical school. If you were going to go to medical school the following year. And she started saying to me, well, so you're so passionate about this. Just drop the shoe business and go back full time to the courses and get them done within like a, in, a, in one year and then go back. Why drag it out? You know, so I didn't even, so she kind of like, um, gave me the motivation and said, you're right. I should just, you know, sell the shoe business that my father retire and take it over on. And if I do what I really want to do is going back to school to be a specialist in nutritional medicine. So then I did that. I went to, I went to Columbia and then I went to NY, then I went to, um, university of Pennsylvania school of medicine to medical school. And I, with a specific intent to be a physician specializing in nutrition. See a lot of doctors into nutrition and lifestyle medicine, go become a regular doctor first, and then they learn about lifestyle medicine. With me, it was the opposite. I went to medical school with a specific intent to be a physician specializing in lifestyle and nutritional medicine. And that's the only thing that excited me. Conventional medicine never interested me at all. I would have never gone to medical school to be a conventional physician. Yeah, did they even have a program for that when you, were, when you went to school? Because I think even today they say it's what, one, you get a couple lectures, maybe one or two, yeah, some Dean Ornish thing and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, about nutrition and, you know, like, and then you're on your own. Zero, zero information about nutrition. There might've been something about, you know, um, you know, vitamin C deficiency causing scurvy and B6 deficiency causing pellagra and this deficiency uh -huh. causing, you know, it might be a little bit of like basic um, kindergarten nutrition in one or two lectures, but it really are biochem nutritional biochemistry, but there was really no applied nutrition for to advise patients at all. Even in your residency, you get zero of that. So they, so the school made me chairperson of the nutritional education committee at Penn Medical School. And then, so they gave wow. me, they gave me a, a position and I did research and I had, and I, they assigned me with some mentors on the faculty who had similar interests. So they did their best to try it. And they put me on the school, um, you know, on, on the, inter I interviewed people who wanted to come into the school, of course, you know, on the school admissions committee. So they actually put me as a student on the school admissions committee too. Um, so I had other things that interested me in during medical school and the, uh, and my medical school classmates, many of them had, have approached me and said, they learned so much from me and more from, and, and some of their best education came from being learning from me rather than what they learned in medical school. Some of the people who are cardiologists have thanked me for saving their lives and, and invigorating their career. So I've got a lot of, um, interest, enthusiasm, and reward from being, um, from having my influence on other medical students and other physicians. So it's, it sounds like you pioneered nutrition in, in this space. Um, why even try to become a doctor knowing that there really was no path for that at the time? Was it your intention to create that path or, or what? Because I knew that these diseases like diabetes and psoriasis and high blood pressure and, you know, headaches, I knew that these diseases could be reversed. And people could stop these, can the stop the acceleration to medical tragedies. And I felt that it would be very rewarding to bring people back to good health using nutrition. 
So I didn't see myself as changing society, but I knew as a niche, as a niche, I'd be able to enjoy a career where I'm getting rewarded for helping people get healthy again. And I thought that would be very personally rewarding to help people earn back their health. Yeah. yeah. How did you know, though, that this stuff was reversible? Don't forget, I was involved with the American Natural Hygiene Society for years. I went and fasted at Dr. Shelton's place in Texas. I observed people getting well from asthma. I observed, I observed lots of people. I got to con- go to their, those conventions and hear people speak like, like um, Dr. Vetrano or Dr. Sidwa or Dr. Burton from Australia. And I'd be involved with people who are my, say my mentors. And, he, and I've been involved in that world before I went to medical school, even though there are lots of um, incorrect, some incorrect information put out by those um, by those early lifestyle medicine advocates, we've advanced that science and, and pinpointed more direction to be more specific. And, and nobody knew how to like wean a person off uh, anti uh, autoimmune drugs for lupus or for psoriasis, and you know, or how to take away the, you know, how to how to cut. It wasn't so medically oriented, but because most of these leaders in this field were mostly chiropractors. But still, I was very well versed in that in that world before I went to medical school. You know, and that's why, for example, and most of these people who are my own personal mentors, who I loved and thought, you know, were great, great people. I'm younger, they're older. And I became a medical doctor and they lived longer and eventually passed away. And these people like Dr. Shelton, Dr. Vetrano, Dr. Sidwa, Dr. Burton, Dr. You know, Joy Gross, these individuals either became, most of them became demented in later life. They mostly developed dementia or they developed Parkinson's disease. And they wow. were on plant-based really? diets, eating super healthfully, and the majority of them developed neurologic problems in later life. They didn't get cancer, they didn't have heart attacks, they didn't have foot amputations and kidney failure from diabetes, but they did get neurologic deficits. And so are I you saying that, they lived long enough to get that or something they were doing caused it? Common, th- those two things both play a role. Most vegans, for uh-huh. example, that they're, who's omega-3, the majority of vegans and plant-based eaters have a deficiency of omega-3 fatty acids as represented by the omega-3 index. And these individuals who I checked as a physician at that point had exceedingly low omega-3 indexes. And there's been more than a dozen studies and every study testing this documents that low omega-3 index is associated with brain shrinkage and cognitive impairment. And low omega-3 index also increases the brain's susceptibility to damage from toxic chemicals that, that, that could promote Parkinson's disease. So I became very concerned about this I'm very interested in this, looking at all the studies and following this over the decades since I've, since I've observed that. And I was also in my practice in New Jersey, was one of the only physicians in the country taking care of vegan populations, plant-based eaters, including the American Vegan Society, which was an hour away, you know, which had those members in the American Natural Hygiene Society, were the early, um, you could say, early advocates or, or early um, adopters, early adopters of plant-based diets, of healthy plant-based diets. They weren't eating junk food plant-based diets. They weren't living on bread and, and rice and pasta and like, like, the, like the British vegans. They were eating super healthy diets that were based on fruits and vegetables, beans and nuts. So why are their omega-3s low? Because they're not eating fish? Yes, because they're completely off animal source omega-3s and they have taking no supplements of omega-3 fatty acids. And for most what? people, the conversion of from green vegetables and walnuts and flax seeds, those conversion enzymes to make EPA and DHA is very genetically determined. And some people can make more and some people make less. And with nutritional gymnastics, you can sometimes get yourself to make a little bit more, but mostly it's genetics that, that, that determines that. So it's not every person on a plant-based diet gets a low omega-3 index, but the majority of people do get a low omega-3 index. So the majority is placing their brain at risk. It's not really a risk if you're going to die young like most Americans, because you're not going to get get demented before the age of 80, most people before the age of 80 anyway, when most Americans die. So the the vegans that are denying that this is a problem are probably right when they're considering normal lifespan. But they're totally wrong when you're considering the extended lifespan potential of a person eating this way is not now 80 years old, it's now 100 years old. And if you're going to live to be over to 90, 95, 100, you're going to put your brain at risk if you don't take care of your omega-3 index. So we have- So what about the plant, the plant-based omega-3s? Like yes. uh, what, flax and like things like that, they, 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 they're no good? Well, I hear you, but what, what, yeah. as you know, or as you may know, I sell an algae-based, a plant-based omega-3 
that's the reason why I got into making it and selling it was because we utilizing it with my patients and family many, many years ago, it would taste rancid like gasoline. And a lot of people would yeah. feel it would say it tastes foul and they have indigestion. Yes, spirulina is gross. I would have them analyzed to see the, to see the rancidity score. And I found that both fish oils and the algae oils develop rancid in proportion to the months they stayed at room temperature. So we developed them. We had, a, we had a, then I started to invest in how to have my own brand made so we could have it refrigerated in glass bottles and sent to us in refrigerated trucks and we can keep it from becoming rancid and use fresh oil. So that's how I got into that. Specifically so, to address the problem that vegans were having in later life from with neurologic deficits they were developing. So I had a huge, and, and then, you know, people are claiming, well, why don't you just take more, eat more flax seeds, eat more walnuts? Well, like I'm saying, even though those contain ALA, which is a short chain omega-3, which is an important thing to take in your diet, because ALA is very protective against cardiac arrhythmias. And it's one of the reasons why some of these very well-known um, doctors who have advocates of using a cardiac, using a plant-based diet to reverse heart disease, some of them or a few of them were not recommending people eat nuts and seeds. And I was very concerned about that because all the studies on the incorporation of nuts and seeds in plant-based populations showed longer lifespan, reduced heart and cardiovascular deaths in people utilizing nuts and seeds. And we found out the reasons now. We've seen the data now to show that ALA deficiencies, if you don't have enough ALA from nuts and seeds, it can increase the risk of cardiac arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. So, and an irregular heartbeat leading to sudden cardiac death. So there's definitely a mistake in there in the advocacy of make, making a diet extremely low, too low in fat. And it's the same thing with cancer. Let me just say this, that the same diet that prevents cancer is best for a person who has cancer. So many people believe falsely that yes, it's good to eat nuts and seeds, except for when you have advanced heart disease, then it's best to take them out of your diet. That's not true. It's the same diet that's healthiest for people who, who are to prevent heart disease is the same most effective way we prevent, we reverse heart disease when people have it already. It's not more advantageous to pull all the fat out of the diet when you have heart disease. It's true, we have to watch calories and make sure people are losing weight every week, but we don't do it by taking all the nuts and seeds out. So having some omega-3 fatty acids from nuts and seeds is important, but it still doesn't give you an omega-3 index above six. You need an omega-3 index above six. So you're saying the, um, the algae sources of omega-3s, those we can absorb directly and it doesn't have to go through the same conversion process Correct, yes. because it's not, we're not taking a short chain fatty acid like ALA and converting it into EPA and then DHA. The conversion is a very small percent. You only convert about one or 2% of the ALA into EPA and DHA wow. anyway. And if you conversion factors, so, that, and so, we, so you adjust this. What I recommend is we adjust the dose of the, dot, the DHA to optimize the omega-3 index. And I used to tell people that above four was adequate, but now over the more research done, we're finding that above five and probably even above six is, is, is even better. So we're trying, so I'm personally bringing my level a little higher of recent years because they've shown that um, more lifespan, more quality of life if you're living longer by maintaining a higher omega-3 index, more resilience and protection of the brain as we, as we age. So, you, you know, I've faced opposition and attacks on this against because there are some people that see a plant-based and vegan eating as such with such religious fervor that they see any kind of thing that's that's discussing maybe a, a weakness of a vegan diet as an attack against them and their philosophy and they try to discredit the source or try to say that oh here's a reason why this could cause that that's going to cause a problem if you take that and they and the reason they could sometimes do that and confuse people is because if you take too much fish oil, that could have negative effects. If you're taking like three to four grams of fish, and just because studies taking excessive amounts of fish oil is, is negative, doesn't mean that allowing deficiencies is, is positive. So people get very confused. With almost any nutrient, there's a sweet spot, whereas too little or too much could, be, could, be neg could have a negative effect. You know, so yeah. we're trying to... Go ahead. I worked in pharmaceutical marketing for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you can count on is if you have a stance, you can find data to back up that stance, no matter what it is. That's right. And so what I love about you and the work that you do is you really do your best to look at all of the cumulative data and then right. synthesize that into a very, uh, you know, very clear uh, thesis. Right. So 
Um, what are your thoughts since we're talking about vegan diet? What are your thoughts on vegan diet? What the data is saying versus the carnivore diet, keto, all of these things that are going on. Um, what's the data telling us? I think that the data is really solid today that increasing animal protein in the diet accelerates aging and shortens human lifespan. And that's and, uh, dairy I, as well as the, the meat. Yes, I think that's pretty meat. solid. Okay. However, it also, the same data in the same studies shows increasing plant protein extends human lifespan and that you can design, design plant-based diets to be low in protein, too low in protein to maximize human lifespan and, and to maximize um, quality of life, health span. So there are a lot of people in the plant-based community deny that a vegan diet can be low in protein. And I'm saying, well, you know, we have people, and I've had experience over the decades of taking care of people on predominantly fruitarian diets where they're not eating enough beans and nuts and grains and greens to get enough protein, where they're eating maybe 80% or more of the diet from fruit. And they may survive, do pretty well in their, you know, 30s and 40s and 50s. But as we age and as our ability to assimilate protein goes down with aging, it leads to decreased immune function more fungal infections, more increase of pneumonia and infectious illnesses. And this is my observation over my 40 years of practice with people on those type of plant-based diets. So I'm also advocating people do pay attention to plant protein, but, I, but I'd like them to increase their protein with things like soybeans and flax seeds and hemp seeds and almonds and, and beans and, and, you know, and, and green vegetables and artichokes and asparagus and broccoli. And you know, they, our diet is very relatively high in protein because we're not using oil. When people pour oil on their food, they're taking fat with no protein with it. But when you take the oil out and you replace it with nuts and seeds, you're taking your fat with protein at the same time. So to the extent you switch a nut and seed for an oil, then you're extracting protein from the diet. Did you follow me? In proportion. But aren't you increasing your carbs though to, to, to too high of a rate at that point? Now you're talking about diabetes and things like that. No, we're having no refined carbs at all. We're eating no sugar, no maple syrup, no honey, no white flour where all of our carbs are coming from whole grains, intact whole grains, fresh fruit. It's all intracellular glucose. And here's the thing is that when you're eating animal products, the saturated fat distorts the shape and function of the insulin receptor. So now you respond more unfavorably to a mango or oatmeal because even now, even things that are relatively glycemically moderate, not excessively glycemic like white flour or white rice, even moderate glycemic foods, you react unfavorably because now your, your insulin receptors are distorted and made ineffective. They've developed insulin resistance, either because your body fat's too high or because you're consuming too much saturated fat from animal products. So these That's people on keto right? diets or carnivore yeah. diets, they say, look, I can't eat a mango because look at after my meal, my sugar goes to 300. Yeah, because your insulin receptor is destroyed from all the meat you're eating and all the coconut oil and stuff you're eating. You know, so us plants- it's the animal protein that's destroying the insulin receptors, not all of the sugar. It's the animal products. And the, animal, and the saturated fat in animal products that particularly distorts wow. and weakens the insulin receptor. So now you don't respond normally when you have a normal insulin load, right? So it's body fat that matters, not dietary fat. It's the type of diet. See, I can have, my diet can have fat from nuts and seeds. It's not sat, much, I'm not taking much saturated fat, but also because the fat from nuts and seeds is absorbed so slowly over hours, the body can preferentially burn it for energy instead of storing it from fat. Most Americans get their fats from animal products and from oils because animal products and oils absorb fat so rapidly into the bloodstream. You get such a peak, a spike. I call it a caloric rush of fat. Now it has to be stored as fat. It can't be burned for energy. And once you store it as fat, you're telling the body not to burn fat. You're telling the body to store fat. So I'm, so I'm um, plant-based and, and, and I have low body fat. I actually have lower body fat now than I did when I was 38 coming out of medical school and residency. I was mentioning that before. Because um, I have more time to exercise and sleep and to eat right, you know, more concentration on that. But I'm saying you shouldn't develop high blood pressure as you age and you shouldn't develop increasing body fat as you age. We should keep our body fat favorable as we age to keep a low body fat. And that's how we slow the aging process, not by cutting out all the, the carbohydrate out of our diet. Wow. So we want, because the, the, these carbohydrates we get from plants have protein mixed in them at the same time. Like beans are high protein food, but they contain a lot of carbohydrate too. They're about 30% protein and about 60% carbohydrate. That's a bean, right? Now, the 60% carbohydrate in a bean doesn't get absorbed 
because because about a sixth of that is is resistant starch. It passes through the it goes into the toilet bowl those carbohydrates. So now instead of being sixty percent carbohydrate and thirty percent protein, it's now only fifty percent absorbable carbohydrate. Fifty percent, not sixty percent, because half of it's lost because a lot of it's lost. But then the amount of absorbable protein as a percent of total calories absorbed is now not thirty percent; it's more like thirty five percent, which is more than meat. So. And then same thing with nuts and seeds, by the way. Nuts and seeds may have 10, 15% protein, but because all the fat is not biologically accessible, because the sterols and stanols pull the, in the nuts and seeds that bind fat, carry fat out into the toilet bowl. So because all the fat calories from nuts and seeds aren't absorbed, even though it looks it's only 15% protein, it's actually more like eating 20% protein because out of the most calories you consumed, the fat was lost into the toilet. So I'm saying here that vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans are rich sources of are rich sources of protein, and some of the people following my nutritional recommendations, eating nutritarian diets, are getting more protein than people eating a diet that contains fish or meat or eggs. And the reason they're getting more protein is because those people eating meat or fish or eggs are pouring oil on their food, or they're using honey and sugar and white flour, and they're eating foods. Part of their caloric intake has zero protein. You know what I mean? Whereas our diet, we're not putting anything, everything has some protein in it, and it overall adds up at the end of the day. And I've Can you I break added that down some more, because uh, that's a big, big thing um, that a lot of friends and family are um, resisting this diet that me and my family are on, because they yeah. say, you know, the whole thing about animal protein. You got to eat meat, you need protein. So can right. you just break that down a little bit more? Um, you're saying that when people do eat meat, they're not actually absorbing it because of the oils they're putting on? No, I'll explain it. Okay. okay. You know, there was, there was a study out of England that showed that vegans had lower, had more hip fractures and less bone mass than people on meat-based diets. That meat made them bigger and stronger with stronger bones. So I said, okay, good. Let's analyze those studies because that's not consistent with other studies that show that you get more calcium loss eating meat. And when we analyzed the data from the study, we found that those vegans in those groups were not eating... Healthy, a healthy diet. They were eating white pasta, mm. a lot of bread, a lot of oil. And I consider white flour a sugar equivalent, sugar and white flour in their diet. Their diet, when analyzed for protein, had about approximately 10% of calories from protein in the diet. And their level of calcium in the diet was low because they weren't eating a lot of vegetables either. Their calcium was about 400 milligrams of calcium a day in that group. Compared to the meat-based diet people, who are averaging about 15% of calories and protein, you know, and about 600 milligrams of calcium a day. Okay, so then I said, what are we getting on a nutritarian diet? Then what, I, what if you follow the diet I recommend? Let's analyze that. And we analyzed that. And we found that because people ate beans every day and green vegetables every day and nuts and seeds every day and intact, that we added it all up. And because they weren't eating oil in the meat-based diet, they might have eggs for breakfast and a burger for dinner or something, but they were having so much set calories from either white, white bread or from oil or from sugar or from eating a croissant or whatever, from butter. They were, the, they were having so many wasted calories that had no protein that the nutritarian diet had more grams of protein at the same caloric load. So the nutritarian diet came out to be about 16 to 17 percent calories and protein compared to the 15 percent on those people eating meat. As a percent, as total percent or grams of protein consumed, and the calcium content was higher than people eating dairy products was because almost everything we ate had calcium, including the, you know the, including the beans and the green vegetables. And part of the reason why the people on the meat-based diet diet was lower in protein than people following a, a plant-based diet was because they had so many calories from oil added to their food. Because when we added up their 2,000 calorie diet, 500 calories came from oil on their food. That's a quarter of the calories in their diet. Take away, take a quarter of your protein out of the diet and throw it in the garbage because you just put oil on your food. If I took that 500 calories from oil and I put 500 calorie nuts and seeds in there, I would have just gotten 20 grams of protein into the ex extra into the diet. You follow me? Can you define the, the type of oil? Is it like seed oil or is it just any oil, olive oil, <laughs> avocado oil? Yeah. Any oil. Oil does not any contain oil. protein. It's 100% fat. And because oil has such a high caloric rush, it is an appetite stimulant. And it also, you get addicted to the caloric rush. 
because the caloric rush foods are the are you know maple syrup and honey and sugar and white flour because they are so glycemically unfavorable in white rice, and the high caloric rush foods are also oil and animal fats. It's butter and oil and white flour and sugar that put so much calories into the bloodstream that can affect the dopamine centers in the brain to make you dopamine insensitive and get that rush like you ate, like you snorted cocaine. And people become addicted to the caloric rush. They can't stop eating these foods. They don't want to give it up. They don't want to talk about nutrition. They don't want to know about nutrition. It's irritating to them. They just want to stick into their, they just, they're, they're habituated to their caloric rush of eating high calorie foods and they don't care if they're overweight. Oil is a contributor to being overweight. It makes people want to eat more calories. Because not only does it stimulate the brain to become dopamine insensitive and to drive the increase of risk of calories, but it, also, but it also drives fat storage hormones that makes it difficult to lose weight. And of course, you know, it also decreases the protein content of your diet proportionally to use those fats. And also people cook with those fats and heat them up, which causes rancidity, which makes them pro-inflammatory as well and destructive to the, to the um, intraepithelial you know, tight junctions between your digestive tract are destructive to the health of the digest digestive tract as well when you heat oils. So there's a lot of more factors we can talk about, but wow. um, what, one of the hallmarks of a nutritarian diet, what I recommend is that we're, where people are getting their fat we're not, are from nuts and seeds and avocado, not from oils and animal fats. So would you recommend so cut out zero oil oils? completely? Yeah. Yes, cut out oil completely. Now, I don't care if a person has a little bit of animal product, a little bit of egg or a little bit of fish, a little bit of some, you know, salamander, snake, gopher, frog, you know, I'm kind of, it's not even a joke because primitive humans, what's that? <laughs> Food sources. Those are some interesting choices. Yeah. Yeah. Because what are people, if they're, we're not eating the primitive humans, if they ate some animal products, wouldn't be, be you know, ch ch you know, running down cows. They, they wouldn't That's be eating true. big animals and kill wild beasts and, you know, we'd be eating, you know, even the carnivore animals, they will not eat another carnivore. The carnivorous animals will only eat a plant-based eater. In other words, the, the cats won't kill a hyena and eat it. They'll kill a hyena, but they won't eat it. They'll only eat, you know, those animals eating plant foods. It doesn't taste good to eat the yeah. carnivore animals. But in any case, I'm saying right now is that we're not putting our fat down so low. We're still eating fat, which are healthy fats. But, we're, but oil is a processed food, and it behaves in the body like a processed food. And that also distorts insulin resistance. Because, body, so it, because it goes right to the fat stores and it makes you now, so when you put oil on your food, you've taken the protein out, you're making yourself more insulin resistant and, the, because the, and, absorb, and you increased your ap appetite and your appetite, you make you want more food. And it's destructive to the lining of the digestive tract. So I'm making this radical comment that's, that, such as olive oil is, is a cause of breast cancer. And the reason I could wow. say olive oil causes breast cancer is because if you put olive oil on your food, you're keeping yourself, you're keeping your body fat elevated. And if you're keeping your body fat elevated, you're increasing the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer because body fat is a risk factor for breast cancer, for these cancers. It's hormonally, body fat increases estrogen production, it increases insulin production, it increases pro-inflammatory cytokines and lipokines. It, in, in other words, it has, body fat is a major cause of cancer. And if you're putting oil on your food, it's gonna inhibit you losing weight, it's going to prevent you from getting that dangerous body fat off your body, and therefore it's increasing the risk of cancer. Wow. So I've heard people say that, you know, when you're eating, let's say, uh, a salad, you're not really absorbing the nutrients unless you're putting some sort of fat with it. So that's why they recommend you use eat it with oil. But with this new understanding, that's actually not true. It needs to be a nut that you're actually eating the salad with versus, let's say, olive oil. That's correct. It's true. You absorb... 20 to 50 times as much of the carotenoids, for example, if you eat fat with the meal. So we increase, we absorb more of the anti-cancer phytochemicals when we eat fat with our vegetables. That's why we make a salad dressing like out of some tomato sauce with almonds and hemp seeds and roasted garlic and black and black fig vinegar, you know, and we make these delicious salad dressings with nuts and seeds, not with oil because the biology is very different. Wow. So, so, you know, my, uh, you know, I have like kind of, kind of fundamental question here is like, you know, oils are used as lubricants, like, you know, stainless steel cook pans, things like that. Like wh what's the alternative there? Do you just use a little bit of it when you're cooking and that's it? Or do you have to find an alternative as well to that? If you're LeBron James and you're, you know, you're six foot eight and your caloric needs are 4,000 calories a day, 
you're not going to hurt yourself with a half a teaspoon of olive oil in your food because you're going to burn up the calories anyway. And you can, you're still eating enough of the healthy stuff, enough room in your caloric pie to eat enough healthy stuff, right? But if you're a person yeah. who's a, you know, a five foot two woman and you're eating two tablespoons of oil a day and putting 240 calories in your diet, for instance, and it comes out to be a, you know, a fifth of your caloric intake is oil. You know what I mean? So we're talking here about a yeah. huge difference of a little bit of oil to a physical, to a highly competitive athlete who's a high caloric requirement versus a little oil to a person who doesn't, who's trying to restrict calories. But anyway, the, the point is that, yes, I don't cook with oil either. I, I water cook foods. I walk them in water or in tomato sauce or, or, or you know, or pineapple or I'm walking them in apricot sauce or but whatever it is we're wa- cooking or walking. Thanks. Whatever it is we're walking or cooking them in, I can then add like a Thai curry sauce on top of that. Once it's once my broccoli and mushrooms and snow pea pods are cooked up together, I can just take a tablespoon of Thai curry sauce, mix it in there with has the, you know, the turmeric and the lemongrass and the date and the coconut. I'm mixing it in there, but I'm not cooking it in the fat. I'm adding the sauce on after it's cooked. Isn't fat important uh, for our bodies? Um, You know, we're talking about the cell membranes and all these hormones that require fat. Um, especially like since these are plant derived, right? Olive oil, you know, avocado oil. Yes. Supposedly they're supposed to be healthy from what. Yes. And that's true because if you take the studies show that if you take the fat completely out of the diet, the people are worse off. It's better to use olive oil than no fat. And it's better to use olive oil than butter and animal fat, but it's not better to use olive oil compared to walnuts, hemp seeds, flax seeds, olives, and avocado. It's best to use the whole food. And that's what the Prevamid study showed. It compared, it showed that olive oil was better than butter or nothing. But the most heart attacks in the longest lifespan occurred in people who were eating nuts and seeds at baseline, who were then randomized to the intervention group that told them to eat nuts and seeds, not olive oil. So the group, so the longest lifespan is in people getting their fat from nuts and seeds, not from olive oil, even though there's some benefits from fat. And, and that's why I'm advocating that pushing, that these people who see diets with oil being bad and so many of these low-fat plant-based eaters or advocates are telling people to remove all fat and painting nuts and seeds as bad with the same negative brush as they painted oils with, especially heated oils. And they're making false claims that are confusing and distort, like they're saying the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Whatever fat you eat goes on your body. Not true. And, they don't, and, and the studies they reference to document though that are not true because they're documenting studies that used oil, not use nuts and seeds. We can't compare the walnut oil to a walnut or corn oil to corn or sesame oil to sesame seeds. We pull the studies in the whole food. You don't see the negative effects. There are people who are, who are advocating people with diabetes, not use any fat because you don't want to block your insulin receptors. But they're wrong because the studies they're documenting that, that, that data from are studies using oil, not studies using nuts and seeds as a source of fat. When you need to use nuts and seeds as a source of fat, we don't see negative effects on insulin receptors and things like that. So we're talking here about um, being, be, being clear so people aren't confused. And so many people in the plant-based world are creating controversies where no controversy exists. There's no controversy well, think- that a low, low omega-3 index is dangerous for your future mental health. No controversy there. We know that every study, there's no controversy that taking all the, thinking nuts and seeds are bad for us and taking all the nuts and seeds out of our diet in some effort to reduce weight or to be reverse heart disease low is not, is not best and it's not necessary. And there's, there's no controversy. So I'm saying here that there's, there's certain issues here that should be more consistently accepted and not be such a controversial issue. And there's really not much controversy that reducing animal products and having more plant sources is healthier. However, we can't say with 100% assurance that making everybody a vegan as they age is going to be best for them. We don't know that that's the case. It may be the case. I think it's the case. But we can't prove that that's better than, let's say, 5% or 10, 5% of animal products or a small amount. We don't know that for, for sure because some people do better with a little bit of animal products as they age and their ability to pro- protein absorption goes down. Some people do feel stronger. They sleep better. And they feel better and they function better in, in their later life with a little bit of animal product mixed in, in their diet in small amounts. So I'm not um, saying that it's a completely one size fits all approach, but it's still we're leaning to, to suspect that to live longest, it's probably healthiest to go all plant based if you can. You'd recommend everybody be at, be 80, 90 percent plant based. Correct. Like 
90% or more plant-based. If you have to use animal products for some medical a reason why you thrive better with it, keep it to a small amount in the diet because there's so much benefit from all the plant material that, or phytochemicals you're going to eat. So these keto and carnivore people thinking it's okay to take all these phytochemicals out, which they actually criticize the phytochemicals as being, you know, as being negatives and things because they told them they, they are anti-nutrients, they buy nutrients, they are, yeah. you know, they have lectin. So they actually, you know, people think just eat meat. Well, that's a hypothesis that's been disproven. Because we have, we follow people on high meat diets to their, and every study that's done so shows shorter lifespans. We have the data and the only data they can produce are short chain studies where people got, you know, soft endpoints, like they lost weight, their diabetes looks better, they're feeling better, they're stronger. Those are soft endpoints. A hard endpoint means you go to death and you see how long the person lived and what they died of. And all the hard endpoint studies show shorter lifespans with people trying to get control their soft endpoints with, with high meat intake. It's like, you know, you could lose well, weight smoking cigarettes. You could lose weight taking all the carbohydrate out and just eating meat. Your diabetes numbers might look better. But that doesn't mean you're going to live longer doing that. You got to, what's the data on people doing that for their, till they're to the end of their life? How long did they live? And they didn't live very long. Well, you know, I think that's important, something you point out, because, you know, you have guys like Jordan Peterson who really probably shouldn't be talking about this. They go on the record stating how, hey, it's cured everything. And then, you know, they're putting out this kind of data, right? Correct. Um, you know, and then you also have people that are in the industry that for one reason or another refuting other types of diets or whatnot. Because, you know, with you, I think, you know, I've read your book. It's very clear to me what a good diet is. But most people are just getting hit everywhere. Like, oh, I'll become vegan. Then you start becoming vegan. Then your B12 starts to lower. And then you have other issues here. And you say, oh, well, that doesn't work. So then I move over to this one. And then you say, well, I'm on the carnivore diet. Now everything feels great. But you don't know in 20 years from now, you're going to have heart disease and, and die at 65, right? So, you know, where does somebody start? You know, how, how, do you, how do you get pointed in the right direction and then continue? You know, because we've spoken to other professionals. Like we had somebody on the show a few weeks ago and she's like, oh, vegans are idiots, you know? Mm. And this is a person that's, that understands nutrition to a certain degree, right? Mm. So, you know, where, where do people start? How, how do they figure this out? Well, that, you know, I'm hoping they can utilize me as a resource. You know, I've written 12 books and I've written about 10 booklets. So I've written the equivalent of more than 15 books. My most, Eat to Live was my most famous book. It sold like three or four million copies. And then I have um, Eat for Life, which is my most recent book. So I recommend people go to the most recent book. And I have the end of heart disease, the end of diabetes, super immunity. I have a lot of, I have seven New York Times bestsellers. So I sold a lot of books. So some people are getting it and like my work, you know, but in any case, um, what I'm, a good place to start is, Eat for, is my latest book, Eat for Life. And my most recent interests have to do with, because um, a lot of people, they know they should eat better. They know they should lose weight. They know they shouldn't eat junk food, but they can't do it because they're addicted to their, their habits. And so a lot of my recent work has to do with getting people to be unaddicted and how do they get them to want to eat healthfully for the rest and stay with it for the rest of their life. And then I opened up a retreat here in California called the Eat to Live Retreat, where people can come and stay with me for a month or two or three to get rid of their food addictions, to get training and to get the um, mindful and wisdom teachings to know how to like eating this way, making it taste great, enjoy your life more with eating food, with being different from other people. So it gives people the ability so to control their health destiny and almost guarantee a long life without mental disorders in later life. That's what I really want to... I'm into, I really want to give people the ability to do it, to like it, and to live long without having fear of losing their, their minds and their memory. Yeah, there seems to be very, very deep subconscious, emotional, um, guilt-based triggers yes. when it comes to eating, right? Um, and yeah, that's very sure. fascinating that you're, you're kind of diving into the psychology of it. Can you share a little bit more about what you're finding when you're working with patients? How can we get over? get past those emotional things when it comes to eating because i know so many people that i have encouraged to get on a healthier diet but they just can't seem to you know mentally get over it yeah and they, and they can't even consider it or they try it and they fail and they go you know that's exactly the point well people are you know all these little nuances we're talking about are important but for most people out there they don't even get close to the nuances because they can't even do the basics of eating right you know the basics yeah. of eating right is having a big salad every day, having a bowl of vegetable bean soup every day with mushrooms in it, having cooked that, you know, having, having flax seeds and chia seeds every day with having berries every day, you know, so we're talking about people can't, you know, don't take good care of their health and they eat in a self-destructive manner. 
And they're, so they're, they're food addicts. They're self, they're, they know it's un unhealthy, but they do it anyway. And so I'm yeah. very much into that. And one thing you, you know, I can't go into everything, but one thing you have to have is that you have to be so content with yourself that you don't need the approval of others people. Because you know how in this country, mm. we're socialized to go after other people's approval. We want to get the most Facebook likes, we want everybody to like us. We want our coworkers, our family, and our friends to think highly of us. And our egos, feeling we're superior in some way to other people, and trying to, in our own minds, support that own degree of self-superiority becomes a means of people building their own self-esteem. But that's like smoking cigarettes or snorting cocaine for the, for, the, for the brain, just getting pleasure from shrinking your superior to other people. We have to get back to the basics here, that every person is important. We're not superior to other people. They have just as much right to happiness and love and peace as we do, and they all, and that, and our own self-esteem has to come from internally, from our ability to see other people fairly, to have compassion for them, to want to have goodwill for them, to want the best for other people, not just for ourselves. And when we give people that wisdom where they feel better about themselves and the opportunities they have to have a good effect on other people, and we call it creative goodwill. So a person says to you, you meet a person at a party or as a relative and says to you, yikes, if I had to eat that way, I'd rather shoot myself. Who wants to live on carrot sticks the rest of my life? Or yeah. where do you know, and plus you're gonna be, so, are you looking to give them a comeback so you could feel better than them or that you are right and they're wrong? Or is this an opportunity to have a good effect on them and show them love? And when, it, when you take your ego out of it, when you take your ego out of every interaction and you're not trying to make yourself sound impressive or look impressive, it enhances your ability to have a positive effect on the other person and then to benefit from the conversation. Because then you're only having, you're only trying to think of one purpose and that's creative goodwill. And it's your purpose to have goodwill. It doesn't mean it has to have worked. But, and a person's not going to listen to you if you don't feel you care about them anyway. So you have to get over the fact that they insulted you. And you have to try to show them you care, you have to show them you care about them because you do. You have caring for people. You care, you want other people to be, to, to have a good life and to have a better life. And then you build your internal self-esteem from a new purpose in life that has to do with every interaction is an opportunity to have the potential possibility of having a positive effect on another person. And then you're no longer, then you're taking your own, then you're not, then you don't need their approval anymore. And so many people can't eat this way because it makes them different from other people. And they feel they're getting so much disapproval and they feel so separated from the world that they have to go back to eating their old diet again, just to get along, just to feel socially interacting with people. But the minute they convert their externally driven self-esteem to internally generated self-esteem from the way they're utilizing their, their practices to be role model, to demonstrate what they're doing in a proud way, to have, which increases their ability and their own personal health success increases their ability to have a positive effect on other people in the community and in the family and, and that they are around them. Then, they become, then they're able to stay with this long term without having the conflicts other people have. You know, I'm not giving everything. Of course, everything's an oversimplification, but in any case, this is where we start from. That's an amazing yeah. perspective, especially coming from somebody I can only imagine who's uh, met a lot of resistance, criticism, uh, mockery, and uh, to not allow the ego to be the motivator, but for actually helping others. I think yes. that's incredible. Great perspective. And we're all, you know, yeah. you know, we all want to, um, you know, we're all raised in with getting bad information. So we're not blaming anybody. They're socialized, they're educated, and they're informed wrong. So they have a, they have a whole relearning process, re-education process of how to build health, but how to build happiness, how to feel peaceful in their own body, how to not be, you know, how to feel comfortable with themselves and, and like the world around them and have gratitude. And all these things are important. And, and we have to learn it because people haven't learned how to do this to take care of their own emotional health, you know, as well as their nutritional health. It's huge. I mean, this is a basis of this channel, and this is why we, we're so fortunate and lucky to have you come on and spend a couple hours with us to help educate people and, and get that word out. Uh, because, you know, as ubiquitous as the internet is, like you said, um, I think it's, it is lacking in the delivery of this type of information on a wide scale basis. Yeah, which it kind of brings me to my next topic. You know, we are called Anti-Aging Tips. That's the name of our show. 
So can we talk a little bit about aging? What, what is aging? I, yeah, can you both. define it? And yeah, yeah, you have some interesting perspectives. We're trying to do everything we can to maintain our youthful vitality and our youthful intellect and memory and live a long, happy life. And we're all going to die. I mean, we know that life is not permanent. It's temporary. We just got to have the best quality life we can. And, and we're very blessed in most in this country to have, you know, not to have, you know, war affecting us and we have adequate food here and we have opportunity and we have the opportunity to be happy and to live a long life. And, and the nutritional excellence gives us an unprecedented opportunity in human history to live longer than ever before because we don't have this much nutritional science and data to help people. And, and even the organic food movement, our ancestors couldn't eat, you know, microgreens and sprouts and 10 different varieties of organic mushrooms. I mean, we have, we could, we could cater and have access to blueberries, to frozen wild blueberries in the wintertime and have green vegetables all year round and leafy salads. I mean, we've got an incredible, you know, we think about the macrobiotic idea of just eating rice in the wintertime and because those foods aren't available, but we've learned now that actually the access to fresh vegetables all year extends human lifespan. And has an, has an anti-aging effect. It's a, it's a blessing that we have these foods. So I'm saying, I guess, that um, we have this opportunity to be healthier and happier and make our golden years truly golden where we, have, we can enjoy our life and get full pleasure from our life right up to the point where the aging process gets to a point where life is no longer favorable to live. And that's, around, that's usually for most people around 100 years old where the conventional Americans their body starts to give out between 70 and 80. And if they're even if alive to 85, the last, you know, eight to 10 years of life, we're not living in a, we're not living well. And we're not enjoying lifespan. They're just going from doctor to doctor, pretty much suffering. So if you're living longer in America, people get the false impression because they think that, oh, I don't want to live to be 90, 95, because I know my aunt, she lived to be 95 and she was living in a nursing home for five years. And who wants to stick at being, I'd rather be dead than be in a nursing home. Yeah, me too. I'd rather be dead than be in a nursing home too. But I don't plan on being a nursing home at 95. I plan on being, you know, being enjoying my life at 95. You know, so that's on the so, ski slopes. On the ski slopes, right? Is aging a disease? No, it's a natural process of the body that where cells have only so much cellular. We only we can slow down cellular replication. We can keep our we can maintain our stem cells. We can maintain our telomeres through excellent nutrition. And we just did a study. It's not published yet, but we just got the data. We got the markers, the epigenetic markers, the telomere lengths, and the methylation defects, all these markers of aging compared to nutri women who were eating a nutritarian diet for 10 years or more compared to women on the standard American diet. And we found that obviously much more um, these markers of aging and how and biological aging was of course much higher, much better on people eating a nutritarian diet. So the diet definitely has been proven by lots of studies, but also by this study that I, that the Nutritional Research um, Foundation, which I'm the president of, just supported and paid for this study to be done on these expensive markers showing, um, slowing the aging process through excellent diet. So we have, we're able to now, we have blood markers where we can actually measure how fast people are aging. We can measure AGEs, advanced application end products. We can measure telomeres. We can measure epigenetic changes. We can measure methylation defects. We have a whole, and I just, to, and I bought this, we bought this kit from a company called True Age, is where we got this expensive, full, very comprehensive blood, um, blood markers of this aging parameters. We've done and it we too, see that as people lose weight and as they eat healthier and as they get more carotenoids in their skin from the high green vegetables and as they, as they do all these things, better. We Each particular thing they do gets the markers better and better and better. And the whole point is not just to, um, the whole point of wanting to age slower is so we can enjoy our life more as we age, right? The whole point is aging slower. I mean, I don't care if I live to be 96 or 102. That's not going to concern me as much as being having my full mental faculties in the last two or three years of my life. I don't want to be living alive with, without my brain being, or, or be suffering and having to be in a, in a nursing home or something. I want to really, you know, it's, so it's, we want to live longer, but mostly really enjoy our life. And so you're saying the number one thing to treat aging, or I guess prevent aging, is diet? I mean, that's pretty powerful. Thinking, you know, I mean, you might say, what about technology or what about drugs or all these other things? Um, you're saying that it's actually diet that's driving. 
Yes. That's the main driver. Yeah. I'm saying that um, there's no such thing as a healthy, overweight person. And you can't supplement and drug yourself into living longer. Taking metformin, you know, I do think taking NAD injections or IV has some beneficial effects on the aging phenomena, but not as much as staying slim and eating right food does. It's just a little extra thing you can do. And the only other thing that probably has a large effect is probably taking um, injections or not inj of, um, of stem cells. But that's, that costs about $35,000 per treatment. And if you have that done every year, you got to be a super wealthy person because you're going to have spending like a million dollars over the next 10 years on that. You know, well, what's, you know, what's, what's $40,000 um, a year, you know, to 10 years is $400,000. So if you do that for 20, if you had stem cells every year, it prob that probably would extend lifespan, but that's going to cost, you know, um, you know, almost a million dollars over 20 years or something, whatever. But people can't afford that anyway. You know what I mean? The best way to maintain your stem cells instead of getting injected with young people's stem cells would be to keep your own stem cells working well by eating right and not overeating, getting enough sleep at night, exercising regularly. Of course, the major drivers of stem cell maintenance is high phytochemical intake, a lot of plants. Do you low glycine chemicals. High phytochemical. Yeah. Yeah. Can you define what a phytochemical is? The chemicals found in colorful plants that are not vitamins and minerals. They're these other antioxidants and, and plant plant derived materials like um, organosulfide compounds and onions and the isothiocyanates and green vegetables that are important for immune system function in humans. So high phytochemical intake, relatively low, moderate caloric intake, so you don't have low body fat percent, restriction of animal protein and restriction of... And so the two positive things are higher phytochemical intake, exercise, high, and low body fat. And the negatives are higher glycemic intake, mostly white flour, sugar, and honey, and higher animal protein intake and extra cal and excess calories. So excess calories you didn't need are going to age you. So you have a body fat above 15% for a male. You're not on an anti-aging problem. Now, how many pills you're taking? You're not on an anti-aging diet if your body fat's more than 15%. If your body fat's more than like 24% for a female, you're not on it. You know, as it goes up from 24%, 25%, 26%, 30%, and you know, everybody's body fat is, is super high. You know, except for people who are who are us health enthusiasts. Like my body at age, I'm age seventy. At my body fat now is probably between ten and eleven percent. My own at age seventy, wow. which is which is pretty much the same body fat I had when I was in my you know thirties. So the uh, recurring theme we hear from all the experts we speak to is all the toxins and glyphosate chemicals in our world. Um, I imagine that falls in the negative bucket that you just mentioned. So how do we address those things? We address those things with the things I've already stated, because certainly I do advocate us people, us eat organic, you know, eat organically and avoid chemical exposures. I mean, look at people, they're going to Starbucks and they're putting hot coffee into cardboard cups that are lined with plastic and they're drinking down, you know, millions of particles of plastic every day. You know, I mean, obviously people are doing, they're just ignoring, doing everything that's bad. But when you have this new identity as a Nutritarian, you know, I'm a Nutritarian, that's my identity. Then I'm trying to do all the right things for my, protect my health. And that includes not drinking hot liquids out of plastic cups, you know what I mean? Or whatever, just for an example, you know, when we're and trying to eat organic as much as we can and, and grow some of our own food if we can. I'm making my own, I'm making, even making my own fertilizer because I don't want the fertilizer, commercial fertilizer with chicken manure that has arsenic in it on my food. You know, I even put good, for, I'm even using a good, you know, better quality um, stuff on my, so yeah, I'm living a healthy life and trying to do the best we can, but it's the exposure to the healthy food that enables us body, our body to remove carcinogens, detoxify and prevent DNA damage from chemical exposure. So the fact that I'm living in a healthy manner and eating so healthfully is my defense against toxins, smoke, mm. chemicals, and plastics in our environment. Because the body is, more def is better able to defend itself against those risk factors when you're eating so healthfully. So, you know, I have a question for you, right? Because, you know, I think this leads into chronic illness, right? And, right. you know, again, what Daniel was saying, most of the experts we speak to saying that, you know, we're seeing a massive rise of chronic in illness, chronic inflammation, you know, that wasn't in the past. And it's obviously introduced by these microplastics or this poor eating habits or the fertilizers, you know, and I know with like myself, I've had autoimmune disorders my whole life. When I switched over to a mostly vegan diet, 
um, it didn't cure everything, but it brought me to that 90% marker, right? But I still have about 10%. I've got a little bit of psoriasis in my arm. You know, sometimes my psoriatic arthritis bothers me. My colitis isn't always perfect. Um, you know, how do, how do we, you know, bridge that gap? You well, know? with you, I mean, you, you need to really do, um, take it to the next level. In other words, do you know your body fat percent, number one? And do you know your omega-3 index, number two? Because when you have a disease like psoriasis, you need a high omega-3 index with a low body fat. So you should at least know your numbers, you know? Okay. So like, so do you, so what is your body fat? Do you know? I, it's somewhere under 10%. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. So, All right. The, and, yeah. And, no, I'm not bad. I'm 5'8". I'm 128 pounds, you know? So, you know, I'm pretty lean in that sense. Great. And yeah. so you- I don't know what my omega is though, but I will test that for sure. Okay. Test your omega-3 index. That'll be the next step. So you're on the right track then. It's a healthy diet because we generally- the, when, like, let me give an example. A person has like lingering psoriasis. We put them on a fast and their psoriasis goes away. But if we refeed them and they start to gain weight back too much and eat too much food, their psoriasis starts to come back a little bit again. They have to be in that range. They have to eat so healthily, but they have to make sure they don't overeat and get enough sleep because obviously even overeating a little bit can help, help their immune system be a little too excessive. And the excessive supplying of the immune function, you know, and also, of course, so we're talking here about a tendency for autoimmune patients. So most of our people with autoimmune disease make complete recoveries using these same basic principles for long life. How long of a fast are you talking about? You know, what does that look like? Probably a, um, a water fast of one week would clear your psoriasis. But then the question is, um, what's the right diet to stick to after the fast so it doesn't come back again? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes there's certain, and as you know, there's certain foods that can be more immunostimulating, like gluten or dairy products. There are sometimes people that can't eat certain foods. Even quinoa can be stimulating to some, too immunostimulating for some people because of the saponins in there. You know, so sometimes we have to make modifications to the, to the diet. For example, people with Crohn's disease can't eat nutritional yeast and they can't eat quinoa and people with lupus can't eat alfalfa sprouts. So this is, sometimes there's some, some further modifications we can make for these individuals who need their diet to be a little bit restricted. Now, now in regards to that, do you think there's anything still trapped in my body that needs to be like pulled out, like with through chelation or anything like that? No, I don't. Interesting. Well, Daniel, you're up next. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for putting on your clinician hat, by the way, this is fun. Yeah. Um, so I've been, uh, yeah, uh, suffering with autoimmune disease most of my life. Um, very severe eczema, uh, chronic fatigue, narcoleptic, brain fog, very low energy. Anytime I would exercise, I would get sick the next day. It's just, um, and it still happens to me, actually. We, we were just in Vegas for a week and we were walking 10 miles a day. And then for whatever reason, I start to get sick and then, you know, mm -hmm. and inflamed. Um, I myself have diagnosed it as the root cause, as uh, I'm curious your thoughts, as uh, mercury toxicity. Um, I recently discovered an amalgam filling and after I got it removed, my symptoms started getting better. I started doing chelation therapy, a lot of green smoothies, which I've heard, you know, the kale can pull out a lot of these heavy metals, um, wild blueberries, for example. Um, and I, I think I'm still not quite there yet. I'm still, I still have brain fog. Um, a lot of these like symptoms of heavy metal poisoning, like ticks and anxiety, um, so I, I'm looking to get to that next level. I've been vegan now for about uh, three, four years. A pretty clean diet. I do my best to be really clean. Um, I think I'm really like very, very strict, probably the strictest person I know. And Alex can vouch to this. I don't touch gluten, don't touch, you know, um, I don't touch wheat at all. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious like what I can do next. <laughs> Or they just well, continue you know, on this path. Yeah, we all have our genetic weaknesses and things and more susceptibilities. Um, I would be interested in knowing your omega-3 index and what type of omega-3 fatty acids you are taking, you know, to make sure that's a, that, that's a component. Um, I yeah. think that um, definitely the, the diet's going to help, but also um, I'd want to make sure you're, you, you take a little zinc every day too for, because your immune system, because some people don't absorb zinc well. And like, just like some people, they're eating diet, they wouldn't think of taking iron, they wouldn't need to take iron, but there are some people who don't absorb iron well, and their ferritins are low. 
And people who have a tendency to burn out from exercise and um, they're often don't absorb zinc very well. You know, so I'd look, I definitely look at your zinc. So maybe I would take just a small amount of zinc each day, you know, like 15 milligrams of zinc a day in addition to your, you know, your regular, regular ramen intake. And then, you know, and of course, um, the idea of, you know, most people that have a lot of mercury in the system are people eating a lot of seafood, but you haven't eaten seafood in 10 years, right? Just you're saying you had teeth? No, you in like three, four work? years. Although most of my life, I ate a ton of sushi and tuna. And there's a one point where I was, I think for a couple of weeks, I was only eating tuna because I was on some stupid keto right. diet. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure I have a lot of buildup. Yeah. So with time, that'll lower. But I do think in a, in a case like yours, maybe doing some fasting might be useful too. If you're doing everything right um, and your intake of nutrients are good and your omega-3 index is good and your zinc intake is adequate, then probably doing maybe you know, a couple of fasts where you fast maybe, you know, five or six days, go back to eating healthy again, you know, eight months, six months, eight months, year late, eight months later, do another one. And then, you know, over a year, do two or three of those five or six day fasts, build your muscle back again. It may then, you may accelerate the kind of like rejuvenation of cells, replacement mm-hmm. of cells, you know, and helping the, ex, you know, I don't want to fast you till you lose all your muscle mass, you know, fast yeah. you for 21 days, you know, 10 yeah. days max. Cause you're going to lose a lot of muscle mass. You want to be able to build that muscle mass back and keep your body fat low. But certainly, yeah. um, how are you sleeping at night? Um, I can sleep a lot. There's uh, there's times where I'll sleep 13 hours. Um, and I think mm-hmm. I have very, very low quality sleep uh, because I have, you can, I don't know if you can hear, I've got, uh, I'm very congested and I have been for most of my life. And when I sleep, it therefore causes um, snoring, apnea, People tell me that I choke and I stop breathing when I'm sleeping. So I think there's some sort of <coughs> chronic inflammation going on here that affects my sleep. Right. So yeah. if I could, I would probably add to your my recommendations to you for you to if you could afford it to get a, a hyperbaric chamber and do the hyper the home hyperbaric for like mm-hmm. a half an hour every day too. Okay. To help with oxygenation of your brain and things. You know what I mean? Because if you're getting too tired out from exercise, you know, um, and of course, exercise every day, but not to the point where you get exhausted. You know what I mean? Do it, yep. exercise yourself with a scientific dose where you really feel some training effect, but not so you're so exhausted the next day. So you maybe cut back on the amount you do, do, but still do something every day, even if it's a minute. You know what I mean? Figure out what you can do that's safe for you each day. Yeah. And then do a little bit of hyperbaric. Okay. And you know what I also might do with you? Might also just because of your dysgenetic, these tendencies. I have a product called Ultra Cell Biotech, which has bl- black turmeric and the curcumins and the certines from green teas and astragalus. You've probably heard about these things. You're probably doing it where you're taking these things that help the body kind of like yep. the cellular detox against those things and help the cells. One that's one. And then the one last thing is you can get elemental magnesium that you drop into a glass of water, into purified water that makes the water full of hydrogen. Because when you get these hydrogen mach- water machines, they don't put much hydrogen in the water. They're kind of a waste of money. Because you buy these big machines that cost $1,000 to put a little bit of hydrogen that just fuses out of the water and you're hardly getting any hydrogen. But if you take this, um, these special type of hydrogen tablets that you can get that can made of elemental magnesium, you drop them in the water and they fizz like a fizzy, like they fizz the water full of hydrogen and you drink it down within a minute of the fizz, you can get a little hydrogen in your digestive tract, which can help, which can help you heal and get you to absorb nutrients a little better. Yeah, so, we're all about hydrogen. Actually, we'd love to get your thoughts on a product we developed recently. Um, we'll send you a couple bottles. Um, it's activated in the gut instead of in the water. So mm-hmm. it's a capsule that you take. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on hydrogen? I think, uh, I've actually been taking it for the past four months or so, and I've noticed some pretty, I think it can help effects. with absorb because some people don't absorb nutrients. Well, they're taking vitamin D, they're low in vitamin D they're taking B12. They're still, they're taking they're they're, they're low in nutrients, even though they're eating the, the nutrient. And we give the extra hydrogen can increase the um, absorption of the better digestion absorption of nutrients. So we sometimes add that to what they're doing. Awesome. And then in regards to fast, the longest I've done is four days. And Mm -hmm. it's pretty interesting. The first time I did it, my skin cleared up and it was incredible. And I felt amazing. And then I did it again a couple of weeks later. And then my skin had a terrible breakout. And so... Um, it was probably some sort of uh, detox reaction or maybe I was losing the fat too quickly. Um, mm-hmm. 
but I'll, I'll consider going doing the longer ones. You said seven days is what you'd recommend. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's a trial and error thing. Sometimes I have people with yeah. certain conditions just fast two to three days a month or two to three days every six weeks. You know, I want to stabilize their weight. So it might be even doing a two or three day fast and then waiting another two months and doing another one might be, you know, yeah. each person's different, you know, yeah. um, because a two to three fast day fast, you're not so wiped out. You're doing a five or seven day fast. After the third day, you can't even get up out of bed hardly, you know, and you're it's stuck tough. in bed and yeah. you got to not work or anything. So it might be okay for you to just do a two or three day fast and just to introduce food slowly after the fast and super clean after the two days of not eating. So it's like two days of fasting, two and a half days of fasting, then super clean organic eating with sprouts and steamed zucchini. And you're still eating, you know, and then you're gradually getting back to a full food. It took you a few more days to get back to your normal diet again. So you still got the benefit of almost like fasting four or five days because your diet and the few days after your fast was so clean and so, and so restricted. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that um, you can make further progress. And I think you're certainly on the right track to getting, you know, it's so interesting and funny and interesting that we can get people healthier as they get older because we did so many wrong things as we, when we were younger and it could take a few years to get back our health all the way as we got older, but we're going to, by the time we're going to get it right, you know, we're going to figure it out to make it right for us. And what's the best thing for us to the healthiest way for us to live. You know, it's incredible. I can tell you at 41, I feel better than I felt when I was 15. Yeah. More, more you can be healthier now energy. than when you were, when you're younger. So many, we're seeing that so many cases and you're a good example of that. Taking yeah. better care of your health now. You know, what, what's going on? We, we see cancer on the rise. I think last time I heard was one in three people or something are, are, are going to get cancer or something ridiculous. Um, you know, I know I know we kind of covered the basis. Speaking yeah, we before, covered you know, a lot of the basis because yeah. people are eating more junk than ever before. You know, more fast food, more plastics in the food. They're doing everything. You know, even though there are some people eating healthier and taking better care of their health, there's still a bigger population that are eating more, more unhealthfully. And, and we know that the same factors that prevent cancer enhance lifespan with people who have cancer. So let me explain it this way, is that I'll give a, quick, a few examples. One lady, her name is Pam, and she came to me with metastatic ovarian cancer with four liters of metastatic um, fluid that collapsed her lung. And she had to have you know, her lung re- reinflated with a, by sucking out the, the, me- the cancerous fluid and by putting a chest tube in. And she took chemotherapy. And this was 27 years ago, and she was given six months to live. This was in, I think, 1997 or something. But in any case, she's still alive today. Um, she didn't have cancer, never came back again. And the reason why the doctors who treated her with chemo told her she probably wasn't going to live more than six to 12 months is because even though chemo can decrease the ovarian cancer spread and kill the cancer cells, it doesn't kill every cell. Some cells escape chemo and those cells, stray cells, you know, come back, start coming back later and you can't kill them because they're the ones that escaped chemo the first time. They're more resilient. So what this approach did for her is that it improved her immune function so she wouldn't be damaged from the chemotherapeutic agent, destroying her immunity for future resistance against future cancers. And it also allowed the immune system to seek and destroy and to cause apoptosis or destruction of other abnormal cells that were not hit by the chemo because there was too much cancer there. And when there's masses, the immune system can't go there and remove a big mass or, or take a, a stage four cancer and completely cure it. But of course, if you have just residual cells, it was very important to allow her to be alive today. And I have another case, another person who had ovarian cancer, metastatic, who would have been dead, who's now lived more than 20 years with it. And I have a relative of mine um, who, for, and also we're talking about patients who had metastatic breast cancer as well. And certainly if they have premenopausal metastatic cancer, it could be a very aggressive cancer that can kill them. And these aggressive cancers that can kill people have cells that are replicating more rapidly but those more cells that are replicating more rapidly that can kill you are more susceptible to chemotherapy. The indolent cancers, the slow growing cancers like garden variety breast cancer or prostate cancer, chemo hardly works. It doesn't work at all. It has almost no effect in extending lifespan because the cancer is slow, so slow growing that it's not going to be killed by the chemo very effectively. So with these slow growing cancers, it's better to remove the mass of the tumor surgically and then follow the right diet for escaped cells. And with rapidly growing cancers, it's better to get chemo and then treat any stray cells with a diet the same way. So we do see that people with cancer 
have an opportunity to have a normal lifespan or not get recurrence of the original cancer like they would have expected had they not eaten this healthfully. And I've seen that, you know, in scores of cases time and time again in all the people we've been treating. So I have people that come to my retreat here and they're not really coming for a cancer cure. They're coming to prevent recurrence of their cancer from ever coming back again, for example. You know what I mean? Have you seen any cases where patients didn't require surgery or chemo? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a woman. Um, she just passed away, but she was close to 100 years old. She came to me, um, you know, I think, again, it was it might be 20, 25 years ago. And she had um, non-hydrogen lymphoma, um, stage four, masses all wow. over her body. She wow. just went on a diet. Wow. They all shrunk up and disappeared. And I've seen I have two of those cases already with the lymphoma cases that just disappeared when she followed the diet. Um, I never had a recurrence of it again, you know. Is there a reason why you didn't do the chemo at the time? Did, um, was she against it or did you feel like it wasn't necessary? Um, we wanted to see. Oh, and I've had other cases where people who had, um, yeah. Um, well, the, the tumors and the masses were so, um, in, we, can, we can feel them. They were so, ex, they were external. The lymphoma, we could actually feel it and measure it in her groin um, and in her neck. So when she was following the diet and they started to shrink, we just said, well, let's keep coming back every month. Let's keep measuring them. As long as they're shrinking, just keep going. You know, there was no point in it because she was getting a response almost right away from changing her diet, you know. And I have a lot of That's men with incredible. prostate cancer, which is easy to follow too. We won't do treatment with them or hormonal treatment or chemotherapy because, we, because their PSA is going down. So we can measure their PSA and free PSA and their PSA velocity was going up. And I said, and even some of these men, I'm saying your PSA velocity is going up. What, don't even do a biopsy because we know it's prostate cancer. And even a negative biopsy isn't going to tell us it's not prostate cancer. And we don't want your PSA going up to that degree. Let's see if we can get your PSA to level off and come down, which we do. We see the PSA start to level and come down. So we see it start to coming down. So even the, you know, the, so I'm saying just assume you have cancer and let's get rid of it. with the di- Let's see if we, the body can attack it and get it back to going in the other direction because well, it's easy to measure. It's harder to measure women with breast cancer. With prostate cancer, we have a blood test that can measure the direction of growth with a breast cancer. We don't have such blood, blood markers as easy to, to monitor people with. I've got a couple um, random questions here I'd love to just shoot over. In your opinion, what are the top worst foods that people can be eating? Fried foods and, and donuts. Donuts is fried, is fried um, candy. You know, it's fried sugar, like fried butter, and then it's fried foods, which when you heat oils at high temperature, they cause compounds that are rancid and carcinogenic and genotoxic. So even if you work in a movie theater or work in a fast food restaurant, even inhaling the fumes from the, from the fryers are dangerous to you. Really? Even just wow. breathing them in, they're so dangerous. So it's the combination of fried foods, and then we're talking about processed meats and barbecue. Those are also highly carcinogenic. And then lastly, you put on the, the other ingredient of the witch's cauldron is throw some high glycemic carbohydrates in that like flour and oil and sugar on top of the, you know, have the burger, have the pizza, have the hot dog, you know, do what, you know, what other people would go to football games. They like have these, what are they called? Tailgate parties or something. People have barbecues in their backyard. They eat candy and hot dogs and barbecued meats and processed meats. I mean, guys, people are on a a suicide mission. We know that those are highly linked in the scientific literature that um, red meat and processed meats are more carcinogenic, obviously, is than seafood and, um, and egg whites, let's say. Or, but um, however, you know, fried chicken might be even worse. A barbecued chicken might be even worse because it's fried or barbecued, for example. Now, on the other hand, because of there's so much agricultural runoff and overgrowth of algae bloom in waterways, including lakes and oceans and we have a lot of settling of, of BMAA, BMAA uh, dementia, Parkinson, I mean, uh, uh, ALS, or Parkinson's dementia, ALS causing toxins. We have clusters of ALS around people eating fish off local lakes and, and people eating bivalves, clams, oysters, um, mussels, and scallops are the bivalves. And so it's the combination of bivalves and shellfish which the bottom feeders that concentrate the BMAA that can cause Parkinson's or, or um, ALS. 
So those are particularly foods that we have to avoid as well. Even though lobster and crab and, and you know, scallops and mussels and oysters are so delicious and people love them and they're special treats, we still have to recognize that in today's climate, off the western coast of but off the United States coastal waterways or internal lakes or European waterways, unless you're getting something that's like in the in you know grown in Polynesia in or in or in people in areas of the world that are not inhabited by humans much, you're going to get pretty toxic stuff. So, so are there any safe levels of any of these foods? I don't know that we don't know what those safe levels are. And because some people that are regularly eaters of these foods and they've eaten them for years, they're better off avoiding them. It's those people who eat these foods regularly or who live in those areas around Chesapeake Bay, for example, where they're eating lots of those foods off the, you know, in New England, getting a lot of high rates of ALS around that area. But it's those people who are eating a lot of, you know, shellfish and and bivalves that have to cut it out because they had too much earlier in life already. It's the people Mm -hmm. that like it. They should be having none anymore. They should cut it out. Those of us who had it yeah. once a month or once every couple of times a year, it's not as big of a deal than a person who eats it all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I understand, I but, you know, like with sugar, they always say, with sugar, there's okay. no safe level of sugar. Like zero is where you should be, you know? Um, so are these foods where you're saying, yeah, this is zero, net sum kind of thing, or, yeah, once a month, you're okay with it? I, I don't think we have enough information for me to say something like that. I, I, okay. For me, it's always safe not to have any if, I'm, no, if it's going to be a dangerous food. Yeah. For example, it's probably okay to smoke cigarettes one day a month. Have like 10 <laughs> cigarettes a day on that day a month. You know, it's not going to kill me. It's only one day a month I smoke. <laughs> yeah. But, but why would I do that? You know, I'm, I probably, especially if I smoked in my past, why would I even smoke one day a month and increase my risk at all? Is it worth it? You know, I, I, yeah. I don't really, I don't have to have that stuff. Um, I'd probably better off avoiding it, but pro- but I don't know if I had it one day a month is enough to cause a problem. Maybe not. Probably not. But I don't think I don't have enough data to say for sure to say any definitive. Yeah, answer. one donut yeah, a you're... month sounds reasonable, though. You know. Yeah, yeah right. And if you're asking the that, problem with the one donut a month or one crab a month or something, here's the problem with it: because it, it pe- start having it regularly, you like it more, and it makes you more addicted to it, and then people want more of it. Yeah. And you have that. Yeah. The reason why I want people on no junk food is because when they have a little junk food, they want more of it. They don't lose their attraction to it, and they're always in this war of whether they should have it or not. But once they stop having it, they lose thinking. They don't think about it. It goes away, and they're not, they're not desirous of it anymore. You know? Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Things off, like cold turkey, it's a lot easier than to wean off of things. Yes, yeah, very often. You draw a hard line and you don't cross it and there's no confusion. Absolutely. Well, there's also the other thing of like one drink a month, you know, one donut a month, one cigarette a month, and then you're, you know, then you have 30 days of one of each, you know, and that moderation goes out the window. So, I, exactly. yeah, I, could, for I some people, for, like you and I could probably do that. I could probably have one serving of seafood a month and that wouldn't bother me. But for another, or one serving of anything a month. But for yeah. other people that I take care of who are my clients and patients, if they start doing that, they they have such a history of addiction that it triggers them to want more of that food. It's like the alcoholic thinking they can drink on the weekends or one night a week. They just want more alcohol. Yeah. So it's an individual thing. Some people can't do that because it makes them want more of it. And other people can, you know. Um, and, you know, the, the thing, too, is, is you know, what, what we, we work very hard to push on the show is, is like, you know, start off while you're healthy where, you know, where most people are starting when they're sick. Right. Yes. Which, which makes life so much harder. Like, like I've never drank alcohol my entire life. Right. And when I meet people, first question I have, Oh, are you recovering alcoholic? I say, no, I never drank it. And they're like, wow, that's amazing. And I was like, I've never had it. I don't crave it. I, I don't think it's a big deal, you know, but you know, I never, I never walked down that path. Whereas something for like sugar, let's say, or, you know, pizza, this and that I had it. Right. So that was something I had to break. Um, you know, and, you know, Daniel and I have been real sick our whole life, and that's why we're here. I think if we were healthy, we'd probably be more unhealthy. You know, we'd be getting unhealthier as time went on. And then when we had cancer, then come calling you, you know? So, yeah, and, and that's the whole good point is that many people, you know, I've eaten this way my whole life, and I've never, a lot of my life, and I've never gotten into alcohol. I never had a cup of coffee in my life. I've never done that stuff. But like you're, like you're saying, if you had that stuff when you were young and you have some medical condition, why have anything that might self-sabotage you getting well? You know, just have, just live healthfully and enjoy, learn to enjoy it and enjoy your good health. There's no reason you should, there's no um, emotional reason or anything that benefits you to self-sabotage yourself to recreate with food. Because the pleasure you get from recreating with food like that lasts five seconds. And then you're just feeling miserable for it the rest of the month. 
you know, and, and, and also we see that people, they have one corn muffin and one, you know, serving of French fries. They do. And then they don't lose weight the whole week. It blows. Even, they, it stops mm. their progress. They don't, and they don't get better. It stops the progress because it's, you have to build up that health, you know, the, the health resilience and it takes, and it takes time of the, with the diet change to really build back excellent health again. And they sabotage it even with some, even those occasional cheats. Yeah, those are all great points. I'm glad you brought them up because, you know, this is why, you know, because you fight the, the cheating with people all the time. You explain to them that really there, there is no safe line. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting for sure. You know, the, the other the other major thing that I that I love about you is that, you know, you, you give real world solutions. You're, you know, I've, I've seen your channel. You know, you're always like making a breakfast bowl or you're showing people like real world, you know, application of how to be healthy. Um, and I think that's another like groundbreaking thing because everyone can say like, well, don't do this, don't do that, you know, and then people are sitting there like, what do I do? And I know you have cookbooks and things like that. So I think that's really important as well is like, you know, supporting all this data with a real, real world life, like you have the, your location or, you know, some, some type of guide um, mm. to, you know, to that nutritional journey. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. So for people getting started, what do you recommend as like a maybe best way to get started, the top foods with the best bang for your buck, easy to prepare. What, what have you found has been like good entry points? Yeah. Well, I, I do recommend, you know, that even when I wrote Eat to Live back in 2004, 2003, I said, don't start the diet and don't even look at the recipes until you read the book first. You know, get the information first before you start trying to make, follow it. Because if you don't, if you start following it before you know what you're supposed to learn enough, you're not, going to, you're not going to be motivated to stick with it. You've got to really know the reasons why you're doing this first. So I do recommend reading is the place to start. You know, listen, read, learn. And, you know, I do make these um, T20 little booklets that are either very inexpensive that people put like a, you know, 20 days of menus for if you have a high blood pressure, how to lower your blood pressure, reverse your cholesterol, or 20 days of menus for a person reversing diabetes. I have all these things made for people. But the place to start is lunch, is to make the lunch really simple and have their lunch be a large salad with different ingredients in it and a nut and seed based dressing, a bowl of vegetable bean soup with mushrooms in it and a piece of fruit for dessert. If they get that lunch down, everything, that's half the battle. 50%, 60% of what they're doing, if they could fix their lunch, they're on the way. And that's lunch. And we want people to have a big salad every day, at least one. So why not just have it for lunch? The big salad, nut and seed based dressing and put in the lettuce and the arugula and the onion and the tomatoes. And don't forget that lettuce is a superfood. Lettuce is the nature's richest source of sulfoquinivose. It supports the growth of good bacteria. It has no oxalic acid, doesn't bind calcium. And then also put some arugula or bok choy or kale or, you know, put some other cabbage, put some other cruciferous in with it. You know, mix it in with some sprouts or some tomatoes or cherry, whatever it is you want, red, shredded red onion, and, and make your healthy dressing or buy your healthy dressing from, you know, I sell dressings already made, but you can, you know, make, we have great recipes for them. And then once a week, make, or once or twice a week, make a big bowl of healthy soup and have a bowl of healthy soup. So soup, salad, and a piece of fruit. If that's your lunch, you got 60% of this done already. Wow. What are your thoughts on smoothies? I think they're okay, but I don't want people to have the smoothie instead of chewing a salad. It could be an addition to their salad. They could have the smoothie for breakfast and the salad for lunch. And the smoothie shouldn't have too much fruit in it. It should mostly have lower sugar fruit like berry or pomegranate. And it should have green vegetables and seeds in it. So it's not too high in sugar and not too high in, you know, I don't want people to put smoothies, put dates and, you know, um, dried fruit and sweeteners into their smoothie. Just put the fruit, the vegetables, the salad, and the seeds and stuff with the plant milk, you know, with the unsweetened plant milk, and you can have a smoothie. And then with the, the, the juices, a lot of people are pulling out the fiber out of that. You know, right. what, what's your take on that? Well, I don't want them to be drinking fruit juices, but they can drink like, we, we make a juice for people that has, and we serve it like three times a week, where it has one third um, carrot or beet for the flavor, and it has one third lettuce or celery or cucumber, and then one third cruciferous, mostly bok choy, because bok choy is a green cruciferous that has very has enough fluid in it. It's worth juicing because you can get a lot of fluid out of it. So we have one third bok choy, one third carrot and celery, one third carrot and beet for flavor and for carotenoids, and one third of, of something we're talking about benign, like lettuce, celery, um, cucumber. And we give them that kind of a juice. 
um, which is really good, especially for people starting out, because we're, when we have autoimmune conditions or certain medical conditions, it takes them a long time to build up the nutrient scores in their tissues. And by giving them a glass of juice every day, we can, without giving them too many extra calories or taking up too much room in their stomach, with food, we can get more of those more nutrients into their body. Now, do you, do you put anything in there like water or, or any type of juice with it, or you're just using the actual uh, plant for no, we just, liquid? No, we just juice those three, the three parts. We just juice the foods. And I want people to know that if they want to get a hold of me, that I have, they can um, ask me questions through my website membership. They can, come and, they can come and stay here at the retreat if they have a food addiction or some significant medical issues to reverse. Some people learn this stuff and they just can't do it on their own. They need a help and they need to actually be somewhere to learn how to do it. And it's really helpful and so rewarding for me and my wife. We love you know, getting to know people and, and helping people this way. So yeah, we have a place here in San Diego where people come and stay with us, which is a lot of, which is a very, very, um, it's just been a great decision to, for us to do this because we didn't realize how much we would love doing this because we've made friends from all over the world. People have stayed here and reversed their health. So it's another, another exciting thing. Yeah, so I have a lot of um, tools. So people really want to take charge of their health destiny they're not alone and they can do it. You know, there's always help. They can always get help and support to do this. Can you talk a little bit more about the retreat? Like how long they are or, you know, give us a little walkthrough on it? Yes, we're open all year and the minimum stay is one month. And people come here the first of every month and, they, and some people leave after one month, the end of the month, but there are no people coming in and out during the month. Everybody who comes here at the beginning, everybody's starting together at the beginning of the month. So the group that you come in with like the 15 or 20 people that come here at the beginning of the month, they're going to be with you the whole month, the next few months. And then a new group group comes in. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And the people get, you know, they get, um, you know, regular exercise classes, water aerobics. We have a pickleball court. We have a sand volleyball court. We have a thousand miles of, of um, beautiful, tri a thousand acres of hiking in a beautiful park right next door. And then, but they're getting great nutritarian food, all organic. A lot of it, we have 140 fruit trees. A lot of it we grow on our own premises. And, um, and we have my lecturing, but also I have, you know, people who work for me that are trainers and psychology, you know, doing psychology and emotional eating and they're getting cooking classes. So we're trying to have, and they get meditation and wisdom training. So when they get, when they leave here, they have more tools to go home so they can do this and, and enjoy it and stay with it the rest of their life. Because my objection to all these health retreats People can go away to a health retreat for two or three weeks and they lose weight and get healthier, but they go home and they gain the weight back again. They wasted their money. They wasted their time. And even though it's an investment in time and money, when people leave here, they're not going to, they're going to learn how to really live this way. And that's why we encourage long-term stays because I've found from the experience over the decade, over the last few decades is that too many people fall off. They, these, they come for a week or come for a weekend and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't stick with it. And we really need to spend the time of abstinence from the addictive triggers and the training they need over to really make sure they can stick with this and really enjoy it for the rest of their lives. So that's why I do it this can way. You, so open all you year. Long term results. Yes, incredible long term results. And some people need to to get rid of certain conditions. They need to be here a, a while. And when people have stayed more than some people stayed more than three months, even. You know, when you go to a cocaine rehab center, you have to stay there for three months before they let you out. Because it's, we know through, it takes time for people to, treat, to get rid of their um, addictive attraction to those substances that stimulate the brain. So, yeah. uh, so a two-month stay is, is reasonable. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we're really um, intent on making the time that the person's here, they're getting adequate training and learning while they're here, which you can't push into their head in just a week. It's very hard to get them to change the way they see the world in a week and change their taste well, preferences too, you know? Well, it's interesting that you make a reference to cocaine because, I mean, we all know like sugar and like, you know, caffeine and all these other things are as highly addictive or even more addictive than these drugs, right? So right. how do you expect to go there for even, like you said, a month and, and retrain 30 years of improper, you know, programming, right? Um, exactly and if you, right. if you, yeah, and if you have actual, you know, like ailments like cancer, things like that, you need to, you need to turn it around. Now, when, when you're at the retreat, um, do you have, is it a regular day where, you know, it's, it's eight hours worth of this type of stuff, or are you breaking it up in a sense where you have a few hours to get work done or, you know, have your own leisure time or, you know, how, how does that look? Yes. People have to have work. Some of them are working, they're working off site. Yeah. They're working, you know, so they come here. Certainly they may have a, they were eating breakfast together at eight o'clock in the morning. Some people are going out for a walk before breakfast. 
they may have an uh, they may have a ten o'clock a ten thirty you know water aerobics class or ten thirty balance training or exercise class, and then then they may have a cooking then they may have a cooking class at two o'clock in the afternoon or something they have to go to. And some people may go out in the pool or may out and do things and do on their own, but a lot of people are just you know might could do whatever they want. But there's certainly maybe maybe they're having my lectures on eight thirty Sunday morning or Thursday evening after dinner. They have to there's certain things they have to attend the emotional eating um, training mm-hmm. they have to attend. Other things are optional. They don't even have to attend every cooking class. That's optional. You know what I mean? But, yeah. but certain classes are absolutely essential they, they participate in. So if I go, do I get to ski with you too? Or is it only on the premises that, that we hang out? Now you could, I'm going to be looking forward to skiing together. That'd be great. Anytime, anywhere. All right. Anytime. Awesome. Okay. Good. Very All right. Good talking to you guys. This was incredible. Yeah. Thank you so much. Dr. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time.